Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation. Your mighty acts to tell all who are to come.
last line of the song we just sang says, God, whatever come what may, I will trust you. And there is no greater example of this truth than we find in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because he went to the cross, gave up his life, And scripture tells us in Hebrews this, just to give you a glimpse of how much Christ trusted God. From Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Until Jesus comes again, we will not fully experience that joy. But as believers, we can trust in God because Jesus showed us how at the cross. Let's pray. Father, it is so hard to imagine the pain and the suffering that Christ went through on our behalf. And yet Hebrews right here tells us that he saw the joy set before him and endured the cross on our behalf. Father, the same holds true for us. We may have trials and tribulations here on this earth, but the joy set before us is knowing that we have eternal life and it is held in Jesus Christ our Savior because he died for us on the cross. Our sins are forgiven and our hope is eternal life. So, Father, let us reflect on that as we come around the table today and more fully put our trust in you. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning once again. It's good to see everybody and again always to celebrate this time of remembrance of what our God has done for us. The story is told about a man who came face to face with the dangers of worry. Death was walking toward a city one morning and, it, and the man asked him, what are you going to do? Death replied, he said, I'm going to take 100 people. The man replied, that's horrible. That's horrible. That's horrible. Well, that said, that's the way it is. I mean, that's what I do. And the man hurried into the city to warn everybody that he could about death's plan. And when evening came, 
he met death again. And he said, you told me you were only going to take 100 people, the man said. Why did, then did 1,000 people die? And death responded. He said, I, I kept my word. I only took 100 people. Worry took the others. One of the most serious sins that plagues people's lives today is that of worry. And that is something we are constantly plagued with right now, isn't it? I mean, just everywhere around us is an opportunity for anxiety. Everywhere around us, and, and we can talk to about the, 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 the coronavirus, and we can talk about, you know, cultural and racial tensions and all of these things. We can talk about world events, but then even at home, right? I mean, long before there was the coronavirus, we, had, we found plenty of reasons to find, uh, you know, uh, on our own, to find for worry and anxiety in our lives. And death is only the tip of the iceberg. All of that worrying affects us more deeply than we really realize. Before the coronavirus, before it entered into Kentucky and it became a thing for us, before March of 2020, uh, it was a big deal even then in, in the way that it affected people's lives. Tony Britt shares these statistics that are pre-coronavirus, that 43% of all adults suffer health effects due to worry and stress, that 75 to 90% of all visits to primary care physicians are stress-related complaints or disorders, that worry has been linked to all the leading causes of death, including heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents, cirrhosis, and suicide. An estimated 1 million workers are absent on the average workday, the pre-corona workday, uh, because of stress-related complaints. Stress is said to be responsible for more than half of the 550 million workdays lost annually because of absenteeism. 43% of all employee turnover is related to job stress. Mental distress can even lead to death. And add to the list the mental fatigue of nights without sleep and days without peace, and we get a glimpse a real glimpse of the havoc that worry plays in destroying the quantity and the quality of life. These seem to be, it's so easy, there are things every day that we encounter, things that are difficult and challenging circumstances that give us opportunity to react with stress, right? To react with anxiety. And you know, so much of what we react to, that anxiety, is so much of it is unnecessary. As a matter of fact, I've heard statistics, and probably you've heard it too, where people say about 80% of the things we actually worry about never happen. Have you seen that to be true in your life? You know, I know I'm, I've seen that to be true. I'm one of those people that I always try to anticipate the things that are going to happen before they happen, the conversations that are going to happen before they happen, and it never plays out the way it's going to play out in my head. And I end up spending so much energy consumed with that worry for something that doesn't even end up being, being true. It's interesting, it's just so easy to get caught in this trap. You know, for, uh, weather people are uh, easily caught in this trap as well. One person pointed this out. They said, why is it that when they give the forecast as a 10% chance of rain, they don't give it as a 90% chance of sunshine? You know, the, the weather people are pessimists and they're giving us reason to look at the negative side of things. Pessimism and depressing thoughts run rampant, tempting us to worry and have anxiety in this life. But... In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Jesus brings peace to our worry-worn souls as he speaks with encouraging words, and he tells us really the manner in which we are to walk this path of peace that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. He gives us instruction as to how we are to do that. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. He says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. I just like to stop there and just ask us, you know, for all the worry, I mean, this, maybe even the worry that you've done today, have you have been successful in adding that extra hour to your day that you'd hope to have? Uh, have you been a a successful at any time, you know, adding that extra minute to your life? You know, again, we talked early on, just in the early opening of the message here, how actually that works to be the counter, right? It usually takes away minutes and hours and things from our day as opposed to in our lives, as opposed to adding them. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. 
Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, they, they use the grass he's talking about often to fire the ovens that they use for cooking and things. If it's tomorrow thrown into the oven, and he, he gives that much attention to that kind of thing, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What went through your mind as you read those words, as you heard those words? You know, people come at the issue of worry and anxiety from different perspectives. When we, when we each encounter stressful situations, we all kind of react differently to them, right? I mean, we, we have our own way of sort of acting out on that stress or dealing with that stress or trying to cope with that stress. We handle it in different ways. And today, as we, we talk about these kind of things in our life, we want to take a look at particularly what Jesus says here in this passage and what the Bible tells us elsewhere about how to walk through uh, these things with peace. And there are three types of responses, truthfully, that we're going to look at in particular. Three types of responses that we can have to stressful or uh, you know, very strenuous situations in life. And I just want you to consider today, which one of these do you fall under? Which one of these maybe describes your tendency, and is it in line with what Jesus says here in this passage? A man told his friend one day, he said, I have a mountain of credit card debt. He said, I've lost my job, my car's being repossessed, our house is in foreclosure, but I'm not worried about it, he exclaimed to this friend. No, I'm not worried about it at all. I've hired a professional worrier. He does all my worrying for me, and that way I don't have to think about it. The friend heard this, and he would just say, that's fantastic. How much does your professional worrier charge for his services? $50,000 a year, he replied. $50,000 a year? Where are you going to get that kind of money? I don't know. That's his worry. <laughs> this man perfectly illustrates the first response we're going to look at this morning, and that's the response of denial. The response of denial. Uh, the response, this is, this is, I think, when I think of this, I think often of Alfred E. Newman. Do you remember Alfred E. Newman? He was the mascot for Mad Magazine, and he, uh, along with his picture is always going to be in all of American pop culture history this phrase, what, me worry? What, me worry? The, the person who responds in denial wants to sit back and not only let God take care of the providing, but let God take care of all the work as well and have all the responsibility and take none of their own. The, the person who's kind of our happy-go-lucky person. Denial is simply when we encounter an issue, we encounter a significant challenge or a stressor in life, and we say, instead of saying, you know, hey, what might be my responsibility in this, we just say, let's push it. It didn't happen. Let's just pretend like it's not there. Let's pretend like it's not real reality, and we don't have to deal with this. We don't have to look at it. We don't even have to do anything with it. Just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. And their way of dealing with that tough situation is just not to put forth any effort at all, rely on God. You just put it over here and say, God, that's on you, that's on you, that's on you. Well, maybe there are some, some things that aren't on totally God here. It's the response of denial because they're simply in denial to themselves that they have any responsibility to act in the situation at all. And it's interesting that they would even read a passage like the one we just read, and they would say, well, this justifies my position. Oh, yeah, I'm giving it to God, right? I'm giving it to God by doing this. Jesus is not saying here that as Christians we shouldn't make plans for the future or be active in resolving challenging situations in life because that would be contrary to Scripture. Now, there's a little tension here, okay? You know, there are pieces of Scripture where it says to us that we are to, to hold future plans loosely, right? Uh, that we, we are, we are to, to really live today daily for the Lord and, and understand that the future plans may change, but at the same time it doesn't dissuade us from being smart, being wise, being shrewd even, as Jesus said, about the way we live our life. And other scriptures state this, that there is a responsibility we bear. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, the, the writer of Proverbs says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer 
and gathers her food and harvest. She does it without instruction. She doesn't need someone above her to tell her she's responsible. She goes about because she knows she is responsible before God for these daily things that we're to carry, these daily responsibilities. We've talked about before carrying our knapsack, but also making sure that, you know, there, there are these personal responsibilities we carry, but also letting God carry the boulders and reaching out to others to help us carry those boulders. And there's a difference between those two, and the ant carries the knapsack. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 18, through sloth the roof sinks in and through indolence the house leaks. What Jesus is telling us here is that there are situations, yes, there are going to come situations in life that, that are going to be challenging, they're going to be difficult, and they're is going to be a part of us perhaps in the, where we, we are called to take some responsibility for how we walk through those things, how we bring about a solution to those things. But here's what he's telling us in this passage. Don't let anxiety creep into the situation. Be part of a solution, but, but don't become anxious for the solution. Be active in the solution. Show care and concern, but don't get anxious. Trust that as you work, trust that as moment by moment, day by day, you walk with God in trying to, 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 to be faithful to him through that circumstance, that he's going to be right there with you the whole time. Some of us, we struggle with that understanding, and, and at times that's me. However, I believe there's also a whole lot of us that struggle to an opposite extreme. The opposite extreme, and that is the response of delusion. So there's a response of denial, but there's the response of delusion. The response of delusion is this, that when a difficulty arises, our first inclination is to not go to God for help, but to look toward ourselves. To look for, to ourselves for the answer, to try to figure out things on our own. And it's a delusion in this way, because we have this delusion, or we're operating under this delusion, that we ourselves have some of the capabilities of God, if not all of them. The, 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 an ability to handle all these things, and, and we don't need God. Uh, we walk through life, it's walking through life with a type of omnipotence, and that may sound kind of odd and strange, but when we stop back and think about it, we think, well, no, that, there's a little bit of truth to that, right? Uh, I mean, I know there are times that I, I walk through life, and, and I, frankly, I, 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 I might struggle with this, particularly with time. Time is always one of these issues where I feel like I have the ability for some reason, I think, to bend time. You know, like even uh, someone might want to call me and make an appointment, right? And, and, uh, and they say, you know, well, can you be here this time? And I look at my calendar, and if I'm really being honest with myself, like there's not time between this appointment and this appointment to get there, but I still say yes to it as though somehow I can take the 15 minutes of time in between, and I can bend time miraculously <laughs> and end up being late or something like that. There are ways in which we assume sometimes the abilities of God, and we may not even think of it that way. But when we attempt to, to, to handle a situation on our own and we don't invite God into it with us, we're essentially saying, God, our abilities here are better than yours. That's a dangerous place and a dangerous delusion to live under. The great comedian Carl Hurley tells a story about trying to throw a trash can away. He said, it's the only thing you can't get the garbage man to pick up. <laughs> He said this, he said, I set an old rusty garbage can out of the street one morning thinking the garbage man would understand that it needed to be thrown away. And he said, when I came back that afternoon, the can was stacked up with the rest of my empty trash cans. Well, the next week I put it out again, and this time I turned it upside down so that they could see clearly that the bottom had several holes in it and that it absolutely needed to be thrown away. And yet when I came home again at the end of the day, it was stacked up next to those empty cans once again. So he says, the next week I took a sledgehammer and I beat the can in pretty good and I left it out front and when I came home, home that night, not only was it stacked next to the other empty trash cans, but the garbage man had actually tried to beat it back into shape. <laughs> and so he said, finally, I did the only thing that I could figure to do. I went to the hardware store and I bought a heavy duty chain and a padlock and I chained the old can to a large tree in my front yard and sure enough, that night somebody stole it. Just like an old beat up garbage can, it sure is hard for us to get rid of the things that makes us anxious and, and worry. And it's not though because God won't take it, it's because we refuse to give it to him. For, for somehow we operate under this delusion that we are the better ones to possess it when we don't own a dump. <laughs> we don't own a place for it to go. We don't have the means to take care of it. 
And so we won't set it out on the curb, and we prefer to leave it in the garage so that we've got to live around it and work around it and let it keep getting in our way. And instead of, we need to be giving it, we need to be giving it to the one who can truly take it away and bring us peace, knowing that it, it's gone, it's in his hands. In, Pro, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, it says this, Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, if you'll let it, if you'll let it, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, when we reject the responses of denial and delusion, and we learn to trust God fully like Paul encourages us in that passage, we find ourselves actually in the response of delight as we see his peace and his presence presiding over us in some of the most difficult times we may ever face. So let's talk about that response of delight, if we can, for a minute. This is where we find ourselves when we are fully trusting God. There's an important qualifier here, though. This is not to say that all of our circumstances are a delight in and of themselves. As a matter of fact, the things that most often really bring us to the point of reaching out to God and seeking God out are these situations that come about in life that are bigger than us, that are more than what we can handle, that are, that are difficult things. So we're not saying that our circumstances are always delightful, but that we can find delight in them. And we find the delight of seeing that they do point us to God. And we see a delight in that we have a God in the midst of these times that we can confidently, confidently trust because we know that he loves us. We know he's going to be there for us. In Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, it says this, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. I like that, that phrase. He stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Robert W. Sutton writes this. He said, a television program preceding the Winter Olympics one year featured blind skiers being trained for slalom skiing. Okay, as impossible as that sounds. Like, so slalom skiing is that kind of skiing where like they go down the hill and they're like they're going through those gates, you know, and it's like they're halfway knocking them down and they're like back and forth and it's fast and they're moving fast and turning fast and things. And these blind skiers were being trained for slalom skiing. And so what they did is they paired them with sighted skiers on the flats. And on the flat surfaces, uh, they, they got them used to hearing the commands and what to do when, you say, when they said, you know, left. Right, left, right. And they got them used to knowing what to do to make those turns. And after they mastered those, those concepts, they were then taken up the slalom slope where their sighted partners skied beside them all the way down the hill shouting, left, right, left, right. As they obeyed the commands, they were able to negotiate the course and cross the finish line depending solely on the skier's words. And he describes it in this way. It was either complete trust or complete catastrophe. Uh, it, there's, there was no margin for error, right? It's complete trust in the people who are saying left, right, left, right, and then the, the training that had been done there, or it ends in catastrophe. And that's really where we are at. That's really where we're at. We can keep trying to do it on our own and watch things just sort of blow up in our faces. Or we can lean on God. Why trust in ourselves, we who are blind to the future, when we can trust in the one who sees the way ahead and guide us through any difficult situation to see that we get to the finish line? You know, some people I know, I, know, I mean, even I've asked this question, frankly, as we're in this time, here we are in the middle of all these things going on, and, and you know what? We're trying to build a building. <laughs> and we're selling a church building. And, and I know sometimes, I've asked my question, like, God, is this the time to do this? Some of you have asked that question, too. I know you have. And, and I'll tell you this. I don't know that we would continue, be continuing to do it if not for the signs that God has seemed to give us as leadership. I mean, it's amazing after considering all the years of prayer that have gone into this project and, and considering that when we got to this moment, all of a sudden, coronavirus shows up and we start getting green lights for things. And it's like, God, like, what are you doing here? 
And if not for those green lights from God, I don't know that we'd be doing it. But I got to trust him. And I don't know what that all, you know, none of us knows the future, but I know he does. And I'm trusting in his knowledge of the future because he knows it better than I do. And as long as he keeps giving us those green lights, we're going to keep going. And, and it's exciting, it's scary at some times, but it's, it's a challenge. But at the same time, it's, it's something that it's an ex- amazing exercise of trust in God. As he walks alongside us, you know, I don't know anything. I don't know how the coronavirus is going to end. I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like, but I do know that he knows these things. And I do know that he knows what the end ultimately looks like in the end anyway. And he's given us that knowledge. He knows, he, we know what the end is going to look like as well. I think we've got to cease the responses of denial and delusion in the midst of uncertainty and open ourselves up to the delight of trusting in God and letting him take us on that adventure of faith. And what a delight it truly is to be able to trust in the one who has the big enough shoulders to shoulder those anxieties and burdens in life. A man worked on a barge in, on the Mississippi River, and he was carrying something as he was on the barge. He was walking along. He was carrying something with him when he fell overboard. And he came up, after he got into the water, he came up and cried for help and then went back down under the water. He came up a second time, cried it for help, and then went back down under the water. And then he came back up a third time and said to the people up on the barge, he said, if somebody doesn't help me, I'm going to have to drop one of these anvils. Stop holding on to the anvils. <laughs> we don't have to let anxiety continue to weigh us down. We do have to be concerned about things, but we don't need to shoulder that burden all of our own. Go to God, give it to him, let him hold it. Jesus said in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him first when you give. Seek him first when you pray. Seek him first when you fast. Put him over, at first over the material goods in your life. Seek him first. Make him the first resort when it comes to the anxieties you face in the day. Put him first in your life, and he'll be there for you each and every time. And this morning, if he's not first in your life, you're not trusting in him. And you're not in a position to be able to experience the delight of knowing that all is in his hands. And more importantly, there may be some of you here are watching this. You're either here in this place or you're watching online today. There may be some of you where God's not even on the radar of your life at all, or barely. I mean, you're here today, and that's put him on the radar a little bit. That's awesome. But he's not really involved. You haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, and you need that relationship right now. And I tell you what, it was easy to say we had faith before March 2020. It was easy, it, it's easier to say, you know, it's easier to say we have faith and act in faith when the job is good, the schedule's working as we expect it to all the time, everything's there in its place where we expect it all the time. Now those things have changed. And honestly, there's an opportunity before us to take leaps in our faith, leaps in our relationship with Jesus, to put our trust in him even more than we ever thought possible in our lives. And today, that starts with a step of just coming to Jesus. That starts with starting the relationship that, that he can walk alongside you and, and being baptized in his name so that you can not only experience the, the delight of being able to trust him now with the stuff you're dealing with now, but also the delight of knowing that you're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. We've got a hope for today and a hope for tomorrow that is great. And honestly, there are days, I'm going to tell you, it is the only thing right now getting me through some days. And I know it's true for a lot of the folks here today, too. And those of you watching at home, that relationship, the politicians don't do it for us. You know, that that doesn't always work out. That's not where we place all of our faith. We we don't place all of our faith and all our weight onto social structures. and All those things at some point fail us. The only thing that doesn't fail us is Jesus Christ. And he's the only thing that, he's the, he's the thing sustaining me and sustaining so many of us today. So if you don't know Jesus today, I want to encourage you, if you're here, you make a decision, I encourage you to stay in your seat following the conclusion of the service and we'll talk with you and, and come alongside you for that decision. If you're watching online today, we encourage you to email us 
office at NS Christian Church. Let us know your decision. Let us know that what, you, what, you're, what decision you're seeking to make or the help that you need. Or just simply private messages on the Facebook page and let us know. And we want to come alongside you in that decision. But I want you to consider that. What's that next step that God's calling us to? What is he calling to give us? What is he calling us to give into his hands today and trust him with? That, let's consider that as we pray today. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be again here, to hear your word, to hear your spirit speak to us through it. And Lord, today I pray that, I pray today that, that, there's, that your word has encouraged us, that it's strengthened us, that it's helped us to see we can rely on you, Lord, and you'll be there for us. May we take that step let me take that step of faith now with that knowledge that we begin to depend on you and we begin to example that faith, Lord, from this point forward in whatever we're carrying today. Lord, we love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together, Jesus Messiah. You may be seated, if you would, please have a seat. Again, it's good to be able to worship here together. And uh, one of the things, of course, as we close our service today, or get near the close of our service, I just want to remind you, of course, uh, one of the great opportunities that we have, it's honestly a great privilege, frankly, to be able to, uh, to give in the ways that the Lord has blessed us to give and to share uh, the, those gifts with the body as well as with our community. And so we want to encourage you, uh, to, uh, to just search your heart, how, how Lord is leading you to, to give uh, to the work of this ministry and, and the ministry that it's doing in the community. There are different ways you can do so. You can give by giving in the offering boxes at the rear of the sanctuary today if you're here in person, or you can set up online giving or send to our P.O. box. All those things are listed here. Of course, the P.O. box, Georgetown, Kentucky, 30, or 40324. Uh, is, is that address. And one of the things, though, we've been highlighting, of course, through the way, the different ways that you know, God is using 
what uh, you know our gifts are the gifts that we have been giving through this time. And one, of course, one of those things actually I mentioned uh, here uh, just a few minutes ago in the message, and that is of course the building project that we're doing. Uh, we call the capital campaign for that a time to build. And a number of you, I mean, have been faithful content to continue to. Uh, support that effort through your gifts and things, even in the midst of the pandemic and all that's going on, and we certainly appreciate that. We certainly also realize that there may be some of you today that, you know what, you weren't a part of that when we started that a year ago, and you maybe are feeling convicted to be a part of that as well. We just simply want to give you the opportunity to know about that, the, the time to build that fund when you go online and things uh, to, to contribute there online. The, the, one of the ways that you can do that is by selecting a time to build, and that's our building fund. Uh, to help us meet our goal there for the building project and things. And uh, we have like 43 families here in the congregation that uh, agreed to contribute for that. And uh, again, just really appreciate that. If you are here in person, you can contribute to that by simply writing that in the memo line in your check and letting us know how that's designated. But I want to also give you an opportunity to get a little bit of an update on that. Of course, this has been a big week for us in regards to uh, all of this, uh, this circumstance. Uh, for one, uh, this is actually an updated picture uh, from this week. They put gravel down, they put the gravel pad down for the new building out at the hillside. So if you can see that there on your screen, that is where the building will be. <laughs> and the parking lot, part of the, big part, the biggest part of the parking lot is near us in the picture there. But progress is really being made. And uh, I want to remind you all that, um, you know, if you remember back to a year ago when we were doing the pr a lot with some prayer activities for this and things, we had prayer rocks. Remember that were a, 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 a reminder to us as we had them to be praying for the, the building, be praying for the capital campaign. Well, we have those. I've been having them in, my in a box in my office waiting for the moment when they would get poured into the foundation of this building. And when we go to pour the, the footers and things for the building itself, we'll be pouring those in, probably sharing that on Facebook Live. I want to encourage you, you see some of them, you wrote scripture verses and stuff on there. If you weren't able to participate in that, but man, you'd love to, to participate in that still, I'd encourage you to you know, write a scripture verse and stuff on a rock and, and use that rock as your reminder through this. And maybe if even in the next week you wanted to drop that by to add it to the collection, we'd love to have that as well and include you in that, that effort uh, with that. For, there's, project, there's, there's progress at the hillside, and of course, there's also progress when it comes to this building. And over the past week, we accepted an offer, as you saw the, the letter that went out, we accepted an offer from Marshall Pediatric th uh, uh, Therapy to, uh, to uh, purchase this building. A lot of there are still a couple of contingencies to that, things that have to work their way out, um, as far as uh, some zoning approvals, and uh, also uh, you know, the lease back agreement that we're working through with them, but uh, a great, honestly, uh, partner there. It, it, it provided that God works all of these things out, uh, dealing with kids, you know, therapy for kids, speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, all of these things, counseling and stuff, just gonna be a blessing to so many families in our community through, through that. So uh, we're excited to see how that progresses and, and, and works its way out. So. Lots of great things to praise God for. And in, in the midst of this time, and God just continues to show himself faithful, to give the green lights, to show himself, like, yeah, this is part of my plan. I'm here. And so we celebrate that today and uh, have a lot to, to, uh, to, again, celebrate with him that. Also, I do have a couple of things, though, I do want to share with you, um, particular, just some announcements and things. Uh, for one, I want to uh, just express our condolences to uh, Hint Riley in the passing of his brother, Zeke, uh, here this past week. The uh, services, the visitation for Zeke Riley is tomorrow from 12 to 2 p.m. at Tucker, Yoakum and Wilson Funeral Home here in Georgetown. And the funeral service follows that immediately at 2 p.m. So if you would, just please be sure to uh, keep the Riley family in your prayers. Uh, we certainly love you all and uh, know that this has been a, a hard time for you all. And so we want to continue just to lift you all up today and uh, just ask for their, God's blessing upon them as they mourn the loss of hence brother Zeke. Also want to encourage you to keep in your prayers the Barkley family. Uh, Becky Barkley uh, was admitted to the hospital here uh, Friday night. And uh, she is actually at the St. Joseph Hospital in Lexington with some pain in her chest and things. And so I uh, talked to Jason yesterday, and I just if you would just, you know, send a message of encouragement and those kind of things. Obviously, it's hard when people are in the hospital these days because there's so many limitations. But certainly lift them up in prayer, if you would, at this time, and, and so many others who are dealing with hard times uh, through this uh, time that we're in. And, you know, life doesn't stop. 
even when these other things are going on and, and life happens and unfortunately these difficult things happen as well. And so we wanna go ahead and lift, lift all these up as we close our service today. So Wayne, if you would, as we close, if you would remember those folks in prayer, uh, and that would be a great thing. Thank you. Let's stand as we close. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, you continue to amaze us with the works of your mighty hand. You created the universe for us to live in and you continue to uphold it. You're an awesome and powerful God, even more powerful than this virus. Father, we have some special requests today. For the Riley family, we pray for comfort and peace in the passing of Zeke. And we just pray that you'd be with him and Julia as they work through this time. Father, for Becky Barkley, we lift a special prayer up for her for uh, that they can find out what is causing the pain. And Father, a special prayer is Jason by her side. And we lift them both up to you, knowing that you care. And Father, as we have looked at your word today, may we put worry aside and trust you, just as Jesus trusted you, even by going to the cross. We love you. We pray all these things. Amen. If you would please be seated and you'll be dismissed by row. My lovely wife will allow you to uh, head out. <laughs>